receives the message of the gospel even before Jesus, as a human being, hears about it and learns about it. And it struck me there must be at least some sense in which when Mary is bringing up Jesus as a little boy, she explains to him what the good news is all about. Just before that uh, passage that Ted read, the Magnificat, there in uh, chapter 1 and verse 46, that was the passage he read. Just before that, we've got um, Mary having uh, heard from the angel, Gabriel, that she's going to be a child, she's going to receive a child as the Holy Spirit overshadows her. And uh, his name is going to be Jesus, which means Saviour. And he... Um, will be born to her as the Holy Spirit forms the baby Jesus in her womb. And she beautifully says to the angel Gabriel, just before he disappears, uh, let it be unto me as you have said. She's, she goes along with the plan of Father God. She yields to the work of the Holy Spirit as Jesus take shape in her womb from that moment on, onwards. So then we had the passage Ted read. In the meantime, of course, Mary's been down the road up into the hillside um, to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who is also miraculously of child, way beyond her, <laughs> the, day, the, the age when you would expect somebody to become pregnant. Uh, Elizabeth and ageing um, Zechariah are of child, waiting for the birth of who, of course, is, becomes John the Baptist. Then we have Mary's song, you've heard. And then I'm going to roll on, look on now to, to chapter 2, and I want you to pick out one verse in particular. Chapter 1, sorry, chapter 1 and verse 19. Can you pick out chapter 1 and verse 19? No, I'm sorry. Sorry, chapter 2 and verse 19. So sorry. Chapter 2 and verse 19. Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. She treasures up the angel Gabriel's apparition to her, telling her she's going to be a child, she treasures up all the things the Spirit reveals to her as she sings the Magnificat, those verses Ted read, yes? And then, in chapter 2, we have the birth of Jesus, and her very first visitors at the birth of the child are, of course, the shepherds who come down from their hills and uh, visit the, the baby Jesus lying in a manger, yes? And then we read this it, verse... Chapter 2, verse 19, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The gospel, in a sense, is given to Mary even before Jesus is old enough to know about what it is. Are you to imagine now, come with me in your imaginations, to Jesus aged about eight, okay? There they are, there he is, growing up in the family home, with Mary and, and, and Joseph, and by then there will be other children that have been born to them. And there is about eight, and they're going, they go down the road to the local synagogue, yeah, in Nazareth. And uh, I can imagine Jesus, this is just my imagination, I can imagine Jesus coming home and saying to, to, Mary, to, to his mother Mary, Mum, those rabbis down there at the synagogue... They, they, they're arguing with each other all the time. They're arguing about how the furniture is laid out. And uh, the, the women, why are the women in another place to the men? I don't understand. Can you explain that to me, Mum? And then, uh, and then a little, another week he comes back from the synagogue and he says to his mum, Mum, why are all those Roman people and those Greek people not allowed into our synagogue? Why is it only for Jews? And uh, I can imagine Mary thinking, what am I going to say to this bright young spark? He's got all these ideas coming on. What am I going to say to him? 
And Mary says, son, I need to explain this to you now. Long before you were um, in my womb, um, nine months before, an angel appeared to me one day. An angel, mom. Yes, an angel appeared, Gabriel. And he told me that you were going to be born. And he told me that your name was going to be Jesus. What does that mean, mum? It means saviour, Jesus. It means saviour. You're going to be the saviour of the world. And then I can imagine Mary, who'd been pondering these things now for these eight years, treasuring them in her heart, as Luke puts it, saying to Jesus, when I was pregnant with you, the Holy Spirit revealed to me mysteries, things that have been hidden for centuries. The Holy Spirit revealed to me what was on the heart of God. And I found myself singing, singing this amazing song. And, and Jesus saying to him, Mum, what was the song all about? Well, it was a song about the mighty great people of this world being pulled off their thrones. Really, Mum? And it was about the poor people of this world being lifted up and exalted. Really, Mum? And it was about people who were proud being challenged in their pride. And people who were humble of heart being lifted up. And then Jesus saying, Mum, is that... What's that all about? How's that going to be? How's that going to happen? And, and, and Mary, his mother, say, turning to him and saying, you need to realize that God is going to do this and he's going to do it through you. I don't know whether that conversation happened, but it's the kind of conversation would be normal to happen, wouldn't it, between a mother and a child, especially a mother who had disclosed to her these mysteries from heaven who who is bringing up this child who people are saying in the village he's a bastard. And she's saying, no, I never slept with Joseph before I conceived Jesus in my womb. There's a kind of scandal in the air and the family is growing up with this around her. And Mary has treasured all these things in her heart and pondered them. And she's still trying to un unravel what is actually going on? But as Jesus grows up, she sees in him, as Luke puts it, doesn't he? Uh, um, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in the favor, the favor of God, in favor with God and man. There he is growing up. Last verse of chapter 2. Mary has had disclosed to her the essence of what the good news of Jesus Christ is all about before Jesus even gets it. And I suspect he gets some of it from his mum. Be natural, wouldn't it? And if you then turn over the page to chapter 4, and you find verse 16... Here now is Jesus as a fully grown man, aged about 30. I imagine that Mary, it's the local village, it's in the local, it, we're here now in the same synagogue in Nazareth. And I imagine Mary there and the brothers of Jesus and all the people that have known him being there. <coughs> Perhaps Joseph was still alive, the local carpenter. Just like bushmeat, really. The local people all there. And there we read, he went to the Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And I imagine Mary there in the congregation, in the synagogue, thinking, it's happening. 
what the angel said to me, that song that came into my heart, it's happening. Whoa, my son standing here in our local synagogue, taking Isaiah chapter 61 and saying, it's happening in him now. The spirit of the Lord has fallen upon him. And his very first words are this. He has anointed me to pray, came good news to the poor. That's what was given to me, thinks Mary. That was what was given to me. The good news is going to be about the rich being brought down and the poor being lifted up. And here is a son now, standing up as a fully grown man, taking the scriptures and taking that passage from the Old Testament and saying... The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus, because he knows his name means Savior of the world. The local Nazarenes thought, this is quite a bright, bright young spark we've got in our midst. We like this. He's read a nice passage from the Old Testament. Good, promising. We can put him on a rotor for next week until he starts to un un uh, unravel what the, te the text means for that local village. They don't like his interpretation. He actually starts to explain that the good news is going to be about what God is doing in other countries, in alien peoples, as well as just the Jews. He even tells them, tells them off. And then not very long after that, <coughs> as, uh, the, the, the service disrupts into chaos as they take him out of the local synagogue and try to throw him off the local cliff to kill him. Meanwhile, I imagine Mary pondering these things in her heart, continuing to treasure them, and now the plot is unfolding. What she was told all those 30 years ago, it's happening, it's kicking in. The Nazarenes, the locals, didn't like Jesus' interpretation of their Bible because he was challenging their priorities. He essentially was saying to them, he was saying, you've got it wrong. You're looking at the wrong things. He, in a way, he was saying, you've lost the plot. They didn't like being told off, so they tried to kill him. We'll come back to Mary in a minute. Come back to Jesus in a minute. But you see... I want to tell you a story, an imaginary story now. I want you to imagine Mr. and Mrs., what shall we call them, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, okay? Their daughter is getting married. The marriage, the wedding's going to happen in Manchester, and they're getting ready, and they haven't got much money, and they haven't even got a car. So they go down to the local second-hand uh, car dealer, and they think, we're going to have to get a car because we're going to have to get up to the wedding in Manchester tomorrow. Okay? So Mrs. Jones come and look at the cars. And they see this car here and they think, well, we can just about afford a thousand pounds. Here's a car for a thousand pounds. That'll do the job. And uh, Mr. Jones says, <clears throat> no, we can't possibly take this car. We cannot take this car. Whatever not. What's wrong with it? It's got a big bump in the side. Can't you see it? Mrs. Jones, wake up. There's a big bump in the side of the car. We're not having that one. It'd be a disgrace to go to our daughter's wedding in this car. So, out comes the second-hand car dealer, yeah? And he says, uh, well, I can see you're looking at this car. And Well, no, we're not having this car, says Mr. Jones. But why not? What's wrong with it? So he's got a bump in the side. Oh, don't worry, I can fix that on Monday. But our daughter's wedding's tomorrow in Manchester. We need a car that looks good for our daughter's wedding. Mrs. Jones says, does the car go? Is it all right? Would it get us to Manchester? That's, that's I think, quite important, isn't it? Cool. And he says, well, actually, at the moment, it wouldn't. Because the alternator's bust, and I've got to put a new alternator in it. But as soon as it's got a new alternator in it, it'll go. So 
he goes off and says, you make your decision. And he says to them, look, it's going to take me two hours to fix this job. I can either fix the big bump in the side or I can fix the alternator. Okay, you decide what you want me to do. And off he goes back into his little hut. Mr. and Mrs. Jones have an argument. <laughs> Mrs. Jones said, look, come on. Wise up. I hope you've noticed I've swapped, swapped the gender of model, models here. Mrs. Jones says, wise up, um, Mr. Jones. Look, um, if we don't fix the alternator, we're not even going to get there. So we'll have to leave fixing the bump till next week. And Mr. Jones says, look, <laughs> I don't care about any alternator. I care about what my car's going to look like at my daughter's wedding. I've got to give her away. We'd be a disgrace to go in this car. And so the argument goes on. Turn to your neighbor, right, and discuss what you think they should do. When you've worked it out, stop talking. If you're still talking, it's you're still trying to work out what the right thing to do is. Okay, everybody worked it out. Who thinks Mr. and Mrs. Jones should have the bump in the car fixed? Who thinks Mr. and Mrs. Jones should have the alternator fixed? Who's sitting on the fence? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> right, Julie's got an alternative. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, hire a car. Okay, I have to confess, I didn't think of alternatives. Please forgive me. <laughs> for, but for the purposes of the illustration, yes? Yes. Now, my friends, it's the same in the life of the church. Sometimes we lose the plot. Sometimes we think there's a great big bump in the side of the church. We've got to fix it. It really is important we fix it immediately. It's much more important than anything else that we fix this big bump. Meanwhile, Inside, hidden under the bonnet, is something much more serious that isn't right and isn't working. Like the hidden alternator that's broken. You can't see it, but it needs fixing. Meanwhile, other people come and say, no, 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 look at this. Look, it's a great big bump. Our church is a disgrace. Everybody in Luton will be thinking, oh dear, look at this terrible bump in our car. One or two will hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Spirit is saying to the church, what is really important is hidden, unseen to the human eye, can only be discerned by the Spirit. And so, we have discussions about how we arrange things over here. We have discussions about whether we project words or don't project words. We have discussions, as every church does and I've ever been in, about all kinds of things, whether we sit on pews or chairs, whether we have them pay the caretaker or don't pay him, or all kinds of things. People talk about and fall, over, fall out over all the time. Yes, women, middle-aged women falling out over, over, over marmalade at the village fair as my, my friend Richard King once put it in his book, we simply see, we are blinded by the big bump in the side and we fail to see 
the broken thing hidden under the bonnet. Jesus talked about this when he spoke to the Pharisees. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without, fix, without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. The bump is important. Tithing your, 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 all your, your things, doing all the things the Pharisees were doing, was important. Hoovering the carpet is important. The bump on the side of the car matters. We'll get it fixed. But let's not it be, let, allow it to become a smokescreen to the things that really matter, which are the things that are hidden under the bonnet, the alternator. And you see, Mary singing her song, the Magnificat, that Ted read so passion, so with such emotion, such beautiful reading. That's what it's about. It's about a completely new world order, a radically new world order, which breaks in when the Spirit of God moves. And it's about... Proud, pride pe proud people being humbled and humble pe people being lifted up. It's about the poor being lifted up so that the rich share something of what they've got with the poor. It's the radical new world order that breaks in with Jesus that, of course, the prophets have been speaking about for centuries. It's breaking in with Jesus because he's born in poverty and what's the sign? A sign will be given to you, they say to the shepherds, the angels. A sign will be given to you. He, you will find him wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. Poor shepherds go down the hillside at his birth into the family home, no room in the guest room, down through the family room, down into where the animals were kept, there he is, laid in a manger. It's happening. The saviour of the world, radically identified with the marginalised and the poor, from his birth. It's hidden, and we risk talking about the wrong things and putting our energy and attention on the wrong things because they're so obvious and they're a distraction. I went and delivered the, the as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, some hampers yesterday, about three or four of them around the town of our own people, and I was so, I, I think I was more moved by their, the reaction of the people than the people were themselves. They were so pleased and happy to be singled out as being worthy of receiving one of Christchurch's hampers. And after I'd done that, I went down a bit further into town with a two-pound coin. And I went, knocked on the door, went in the house, and I said to the little girl, this two-pound coin is to get you in, on your bus to school. She's not been able to go to school, and she, her attendance has dropped right down to 30% because the family haven't got the money to pay for the bus fare. And I put in an application to the Diocese of um, St. Albans for some money from a, a poverty fund for poor people in Luton. And they said, yeah, we'll fund this, we'll fund this. So a cheque has come through to me now. And I just gave her the two-pound coin... And apparently, I'm told, she really likes going to school. And she was so happy. She was so full of joy. And what's interesting is that when she'd started at school just a few months earlier, September, somebody from this church, I can't even remember who it was, gave the money to pay for her school uniform. She couldn't afford a school uniform. 
And she was so pleased when I went round and gave the money to her mum to go into town to buy the uniform. So she started at school, and she didn't have enough money to pay the, the bus fare. So we now got enough money to keep her going to school. And she, even, she wants to go to school. Now, the reason I tell you that is because it's hidden. It's hidden like the carverette under the bonnet. And it's about a poor family being just lifted up a little bit. Lifted up. And it actually, if it works, and it could well not work, but if it did work, and she kept going into the school, then in, in 10 years' time... She might be as well-educated as, 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 as um, any, any of you here. She might even get a, a job. She might even start paying tax. Wow! And I said all these things to her family. That this, this could actually happen if we can make this work. And it's a tiny little story, but, and you all have all your stories of your own. And it, it strikes me that it's that kind of hidden thing that is what Mary was singing about in the Magnificat. You see, in a moment, a little bit later, Nigel's going to come and explain about the gift day and how, you've been, how much we've all given towards the gift day so that we can, we can balance the books in the church. And it's really important to balance the books in the church so we can continue to do all that we're doing as a church but I'm sure Nigel would agree the operation is not actually about bookkeeping. It's about good bookkeeping and good stewardship of our resources so that we can then lift up the poor, challenge the, 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 the mighty, challenge the proud, and bring about a completely new world order. As we are here this morning, Nelson Mandela is being buried. The, the service is going on as we're here, I think, many hours of it. And what that man stood for and what that man achieved in his life was exactly what Mary was singing about, the pulling down of the mighty from the thrones, the, mi the mighty white overlords, and lifting up the downtrodden black people. But we can so easily be mis distracted by the bump in the side of the car and fail to see the little carburetor that has to be fixed. My soul glorifies the Lord, sings Mary, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from <coughs> generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. So be it.